Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, where for 30 years we have engaged the public in reflection and dialogue on the key issues of our day from an ethical perspective. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church, located on Nicollet Mall in beautiful downtown Minneapolis, and moderator of the forum. It's my pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker. Historian and author David Eisenhower is director of the Institute for Public Service at the Annenberg Public Policy Center at the University of Pennsylvania and a senior research fellow at the Annenberg School of Communication. He is co-chair of the Foreign Policy Research Institute in Philadelphia and has served as editor-in-chief of its quarterly journal, Orbis. A graduate of Amherst College, he holds a law degree from George Washington University Law School He's the author of the award-winning book, Eisenhower at War, 1943 to 45, a study of his grandfather's service as commander of Allied forces in Europe during World War II. The book was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in History in 1986. 11 years ago, it was the forum's honor to host Julie Nixon Eisenhower, the co-author of Going Home to Glory. And today, it is our pleasure to welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum Mrs. Eisenhower's husband of, <laughs> of 41 years, David Eisenhower. Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Reverend Tim Hart Anderson, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for that, uh, uh, Tim. Uh, members of the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Thank you for bringing me to this uh, event at the Westminster Presbyterian Church in this beautiful setting. Uh, as I begin, I would like to say greetings also to a number of our friends in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. Uh, Kit and Bre Becky Richardson. Kit, uh, who I met uh, or saw again uh, just before uh, today's event. Uh, Kit, yes, remains the greatest natural athlete I've ever seen in my life. Uh, he is a fabulously successful architect <coughs> uh, and realtor uh, in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. To members of the Jameson family who are here, Terry and Roger Hork, Odie Godfrey uh, from Exeter Days, Larkin McPhee, and members of the Robert Short family. Uh, Robert Short, and I'm dating myself here, uh, owned the Lemington Hotel here in Minneapolis. Uh, he also owned uh, the Washington Senators when I was uh, uh, in college, and he gave me one of my very first jobs, and that was as a statistician uh, for the Washington Senators, and in that capacity, uh, I accompanied the team uh, on a trip for a weekend, uh, for a weekday series uh, here in Man Minneapolis uh, uh, in the summer of 1970, and that was my introduction to this uh, wonderful city. <clears throat> uh, it is, we have been back many times since. Uh, it is a special pleasure to follow Julie to this uh, uh, lectern and also to address this town hall myself on the legacy of Dwight Eisenhower as a general president and person. This is the topic of our new book, uh, which brings me here, Going Home to Glory. Going Home to Glory uh, <clears throat> covers the life and times of Dwight Eisenhower at a point uh, in which he was conscious of a legacy. These are the years uh, 1961 to 1969 after he leaves uh, the White House when as a former president uh, he is conscious uh, of a legacy that he will leave uh, in American and international history. This is also the period in which I knew him best as a grandfather uh, and as a neighbor. Uh, going Home to Glory has been in the making for a long time. This is a story that we have always wanted to tell in 1976. Uh, just as I'm getting out of law school, we circulated a proposal to publishers in New York, and the title of the proposed book in 1976 was Going Home to Glory. Uh, 34 years later, uh, now it is coming out. <laughs> it is set in my favorite setting, uh, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, I, <coughs> Gettysburg is uh, my uh, hometown, and it's a place that I've always wanted to write about. In fact, it is the first place I ever wrote about. Thanks to the record, uh, to the miracle of presidential records keeping, Dwight Eisenhower is a president, uh, there are actually some papers of mine in the Eisenhower Library in Abilene, uh, Kansas. Uh, thanks to the uh, preservation of presidential records, I think that I'm one of the few published authors in America that can actually produce the copy of the first short story I ever wrote. Uh, I was uh, 10 at the time. 
Uh, in the summer of 1957, we were spending a couple months on the Gettysburg Farm, and a cousin of mine Chica uh, uh, by the name of Janet Thompson, uh, who was living in Chicago, uh, came east uh, with uh, my aunt and uncle uh, to visit us in Gettysburg. She made a huge impression on me, and so I wrote my first short story entitled Janet Stay. Uh, <clears throat> on July 15, 1958, according to the records of the President's Secretary, Ansi Whitman, who occupied the President's space outside the Oval Office where the President operates today, on that day, David H. 10, that was me, walked in uh, with a handwritten copy of this short story, and I walked up to the President's Secretary and said, type this up. Uh, <clears throat> So she typed up Janet Stay. Uh, we walked over to one of these newfangled Xerox machines. Uh, we ran off uh, 15 copies of uh, Janet Stay. And July 15th, 1958 was a good day to have 15 copies of your first short story on hand because Marines were landing in Lebanon that morning. Uh, the cabinet is meeting and recessing. The National Security Council is meeting and recessing. I put Janet Stay on sale outside the Oval Office for 15 cents a copy and went through a first printing in 25 minutes. <laughs> I also got something that every author must have, and that is encouragement. I looked up, uh, I still had a couple copies, and I am looking at this man standing in front of me, a hero, as I am a boy, he is the Vice President of the United States. He is standing there in a gray suit, uh, Vice President Nixon, and he says, uh, well, young man, David, what is this? And I said, no, this is my first uh, uh, short story, it's for sale for 15 cents. His aide digs into a pocket, produces 15 cents two days later. I get a letter from the Pre Vice President of the United States saying, Dear David, I want you to know that after dinner last night, the family gathered for a reading of Janet Stay. <laughs> Mrs. Nixon and the girls all agree that you are one of our very favorite authors. <laughs> so encouragement. Our topic is the presidency in twilight. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower is an elder statesman. What follows the White House? You know, this is a topic. Uh, about presidents, which I think has been shortchanged by historians. Uh, when we talk about a legacy, we talk about actions, and we also talk about character, uh, because actions and character are, are interwoven. And I think that it is in the retirement years that character does come through. One of our favorite books is Candace Millard's River of Doubt, which chronicles the restless Teddy Roosevelt, a vivid personality, as he worked off the shock of his defeat in 1912 by hazarding an exploration of the un uncharted regions of the Amazon River, almost dying in the process. This is a vivid personality, and the personality of Teddy Roosevelt, which is also part of his legacy, uh, comes through uh, in that book. Uh, in, uh, incidentally, uh, Roosevelt, uh, Teddy Roosevelt's is a significant story that is uh, losing in 1912 and uh, plying the river of doubt. In a country which today, under the 22nd Amendment, requires its chiefs of, uh, chiefs of state to step down after two terms in office, imposing limits, therefore, on powerful and charismatic individuals who in many places would rule uh, perpetually. Uh, we require our presidents to step aside, and we require them to accept this limitation cheerfully, uh, and they do. Thus, Going Home to Glory begins on January 20th, not 1953, but 1961. As expectant throngs gather in Washington uh, to ring in the new presidency of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. In the snows blanketing the area, the Eisenhowers quietly make their way home uh, to Gettysburg, driving past uh, thousands of well wishers uh, who lined the highways for 70 miles uh, between the Washington suburbs and Gettysburg. They are returning for a family dinner at our house at the corner of my grandfather's farm. This was a happy, sad night, January 20th, 1961. I remember, almost 13 years old, the toasts being given by grown-ups that night, toasting their past lives and the beginning of their new life in Gettysburg. Now, in the years to come, Dwight Eisenhower would not lead an expedition along the river of doubt, but as a former president, he had occasion to doubt. He had no illusions what the narrow Republican defeat in 1960 uh, would probably mean for his political legacy, at least in the short run. Uh, he had doubts uh, about the country's future. He had regrets. My father told me once, uh, and I remember his words, he said, you know, it is impossible for someone to leave an office such as the presidency 
without having personal regrets, but he had many satisfactions as well. Dwight Eisenhower in this period would actively promote a legacy, uh, his legacy, uh, through promotion of the Republican cause, through his writings, and through the institutions uh, that he supported. Uh, in anticipation of today, I made up or I drew up a list of his personal and political legacies that I think that he is and in the future will be appreciated for. A personal, political, and military legacy, uh, I think beyond doubt, was his ability in 1943, 1944, and 1945 to embody the soldier of democracy in America's great crusade in Europe. Uh, the Russian novelist Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote once that in every life there is a moment that is decisive for a person's convictions and character. To think of those events uh, and actions in this way, surely uh, this late winter and early spring of 1944 in command of the overlord operation was such a moment for Dwight Eisenhower. Multiply his example many times. This was a decisive event for the hundreds of thousands of soldiers who participated in this landing as well. And then multiply those numbers again to consider the millions uh, of Americans in 1942, 43, 44, and 45 uh, fighting on two fronts who experienced uh, something quite similar. I think he embodied the traits uh, of the American GI, and this is a very uh, important legacy. Um, <clears throat> and I would say also that it is accurate, I believe, uh, to say that, uh, to emphasize how important this was, uh, nothing that happens before Dwight, uh, to Dwight Eisenhower before 1943 and 44, I think, could have specifically prepared him uh, for the uh, responsibility that he assumed in the spring of 1944. Um, <clears throat> and yet, subsequently, with victory in Europe, it becomes predictable and inevitable that he become President of the United States. I don't think that the American GIs who fought in World War II could have been specifically prepared uh, for the adventure that they undertook, but projecting beyond 1944, it becomes predictable and inevitable that Americans will shape the peace to come. His political legacy following World War II are his lay in his efforts uh, to win the peace uh, he becomes an Army Chief of Staff. He serves in the uh, uh, Pentagon, and in this era, 1946 through 1951, uh, he works closely with uh, Democrats, including President Truman, to organize uh, an American relief and military defense effort, both uh, in Europe and in the Far East. Part of this legacy of winning the peace is a political one. He emerges as a Republican in 1952 because he believed it was necessary to break uh, the mono monopoly of a single party uh, on the White House to restore the two-party system uh, and to restore the Republican Party as an effective opposition force uh, in the early uh, post-war era. This is all part of restoring normalcy uh, in national affairs and reaching for a kind of bipartisan spirit in the conduct of our national business. <clears throat> uh, related to this legacy uh, is also one that uh, uh, he organizes within the Republican Party itself, and that is to point the Republican Party, which had been an opposition force uh, for 20 years, uh, to convert the Republican Party into a governing uh, party oriented towards the future and ideas that could actually uh, shape and reshape the country as it existed in the 1950s. His legacy as president, therefore, is one of peace and prosperity, stability, the Eisenhower presidency sets a, uh, provides a setting for innovation. In the 1950s, America enters the space age, the computer age, the atomic age. We build an interstate system. We build hundreds of thousands of schools. We adopt new living patterns. The civil rights movement uh, gets, uh, uh, gains great impetus in the 1950s and early 1960s, all advanced, I believe, by wise and careful planning. By the end of the decade, there is unfinished business uh, at home, but Americans are winning the peace, winning the peace at home. Winning the peace abroad, there is also unfinished business uh, that consisted of uh, 1953 and 1954, a policy of containing China. We did not have a policy towards China until Eisenhower took office. Uh, in the Eisenhower presidency, we enter and consolidate a presence in the Middle East 
uh, one of his important uh, initiatives as president was to seek peace uh, with the Soviet Union and to start the process of arms control, which would unfold over a period of 30 years. To be sure, there is much unfinished business. In Going Home to Glory, we look at the relationship between Eisenhower and his successors, John Kennedy, uh, in dealing with the crisis points in Berlin, Laos, Vietnam, and Cuba. With the great Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, which we cover in this book, uh, we emerge into sort of a different era. They're, they are changing times that we chronicle. 1963 is the height of the civil rights uh, great awakening uh, in America. Within a year, uh, conservatism uh, will launch a fresh start within the Republican Party. Dwight Eisenhower, as an elder statesman, will be drawn again into the process of fusing this energy, this great conservative energy, into a winning formula uh, for 1968. Other stories merge uh, in the 1960s. Vietnam starts, and Dwight Eisenhower becomes uh, a counselor to Lyndon Johnson uh, as well. And all along, we are living with him on the corner of the farm. And we come to appreciate his personal characteristics and personal traits which I think are also part of a political legacy. I think that in the post-presidential years, uh, someone who has been president is much easier to know uh, as the lar layers of staff and officialdom uh, are peeled away, the personality and the character remain. What is it that made Dwight Eisenhower such an outstanding leader? This is a question I asked as a boy, and it was a question that I was able to examine uh, unconsciously uh, as his uh, neighbor and grandson uh, in Gettysburg. We were neighbors, and so I recall him not only as a general and a statesman, but also as a farmer, a hunter, a painter, a golfer, uh, a former ball player, a sage, a supervisor, and eventually as a companion as uh, uh, he became confined uh, as, and as his uh, health failed. Uh, in later years. Uh, I knew him in a very telling capacity as a supervisor. He owned the farm. I worked on the farm back when I was writing Janet's Stay in the summer of 1958. I was also working at the farm for 25 cents an hour. Uh, if you go to the Gettysburg farm, if you go to Gettysburg, uh, the Eisenhower farm is part of the national park system. I recommend you stop by and see it and admire the fences. I painted the fences five times. <laughs> Uh, I had lots of ups and downs uh, in this uh, five-year career on the farm. I started work in 58. I described that. Uh, I had a lapse uh, in 1963, which was kind of revealing. I had a second job downtown at, that I think that I was more interested in at Gettysburg College, but I was working on the farm, and I got a little careless one day, uh, played cards too long over a lunch hour. I thought Granddad had gone back to the office downtown. I didn't think he was there. Suddenly, he walks through the room. Uh, anybody who's experienced the temper, the force uh, of that individual uh, has a vivid recollection of it, and so do I. I did not hear his words particularly, but I did hear three, you are fired. <laughs> we had a golf date that afternoon. I didn't know what was going to come of this. I'm 15 years old. 3.30, lo and behold, the car does pull up. I get in the car. We ride in silence to Gettysburg Country Club. Uh, we played the first hole in silence. We played the second hole in silence. Uh, on the tee of the third hole, uh, he says to me, David, I allow my associates one mistake a year. You've had yours. <laughs> he rehired me, proving that to err is human and to forgive divine. <laughs> Our personal and political stories uh, merge from 1963 onwards. The war in Indochina and Vietnam uh, is enveloping the 1960 and 68 races uh, sort of merge. Uh, family stories merge as I become involved uh, with Julie. Uh, I met Julie in the fall of 1966, my with in Going Home to Glory. Uh, we had met several times before. This is a kind of uh, unlikely combination, I, I admit. I can remember calling on her at Smith. I was at Amherst, seven miles away, uh, in September of 1966 because my grandmother insisted I do that. Uh, I'm not sure I would have done it otherwise. And uh, turned up at Baldwin House, and I liked her instantly, so I invited her out for a dish of ice cream. Uh, I realized I'd uh, paid all my money in the cab uh, getting over there, so she picked up the tab the first time. Uh, <clears throat> I worked up the nerve to return about five or six weeks later uh, and uh, had one of these encounters with the, the proctor, the female proctor at uh, her house, Baldwin. 
Uh, Smith had a Proctor system then. A bio major with long straight hair and horn rimmed glasses uh, was uh, waiting at the entrance. And uh, this is one of these exchanges that uh, uh, says how unlikely this was. I can remember feeling faintly self-conscious presenting myself to her saying, I am David Eisenhower and I would like to see Julie Nixon. She gives me a long look and says, well, my name is Harry Truman. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But I persisted, and step by step, the world, uh, I found myself uh, drawn into this world that Dwight Eisenhower knew uh, well, a world that I had missed through him. I knew him as a grandfather and as a former president, uh, the world of national campaigns and how they work, and the world of political missions uh, that confront presidents and how they are uh, framed and formulated in a national campaign, uh, and a connection that I did not see clearly as a teenager, but see uh, uh, clearly now between Korea and Vietnam in the wider effort following 1945 uh, to end wars and to win the peace. I would make a concluding point as well. Uh, I've emphasized personal legacy, or I'm talking about personal legacy, and I think that a personal legacy uh, is important uh, to the uh, 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 public when we're talking about presidents, I think that personal legacies are important human legacies that individuals uh, lead as well. Last week, in connection with Going Home to Glory, my wife and I were interviewed uh, by Art Carey of the Philadelphia Inquirer. We had him to our home, and he arrived uh, with a copy of an unpublished book that he and his brothers and sisters had written about their grandfather. And we looked through that. I have seen a number of these books over the last number of years, and I've talked to people even this morning uh, who have collected uh, their parents' uh, papers left by their parents and grandparents. But in this book, uh, this is a family coming together to write for their own sakes, and I think there is a deep need here, about an individual who made a huge difference uh, in their lives. There is a deep need to acknowledge uh, such people uh, and uh, in this lies a very important legacy, I think, and Julie and I uh, felt that need. There is not a real effort in going home to glory to expound on the image of Dwight Eisenhower in World War II or as president. What we seek to do is to expand the story, to make a record of other times he should be remembered for as well. The times in Gettysburg, in the California desert, uh, in his trips uh, through the Midwest, uh, and so on, in settings where it was possible in the 1960s to know him, to receive his advice regularly and his tips for healthy living, uh, to benefit by his guidance and support, to appreciate his enthusiasms, to see the personal example he set of serenity and faith in his frank acceptance of his limitations and infirmities as time went on. He was to know his optimism, his affection for others, uh, to understand why it was that he had such an ability to shoulder responsibility and to see his profound faith uh, in his church and God and his faith in America's future. And so we made a record of this man. Why was he a great man? I think the answer to that question is very simple. He was a great man because he was a good man. Uh, he was a good man in small things and in large, large things as well. Now this book took a while to gel. Uh, but uh, stories, if they matter enough to you, do gel. Uh, and so we are grateful that we had the opportunity uh, to complete this book. We are uh, very grateful for the support of Simon & Schuster, and I am grateful to follow Julie here at Westminster Presbyterian today for this town hall uh, to address the question of Dwight Eisenhower's legacy and to share with those present our account of it in Going Home to Glory. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, David Eisenhower. You are listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, broadcast from Westminster Presbyterian Church on Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. I'm Tim Hart Anderson, senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church and moderator of the forum. Our speaker today is David Eisenhower, author of the new book, Going Home to Glory, a memoir of life with Dwight D. Eisenhower. 
While the ushers collect questions from our in-house audience, I'd like to invite the radio audience to join us for our spring 2011 season. Information will be available online in January at westminsterforum.org. And now, Mr. Eisenhower, if you would return to the pulpit, I will present the questions from our audience. You mentioned in the book the, the exchange between uh, President Kennedy and your grandfather about how he would be known, uh, the salutation, whether it be President Eisenhower or General Eisenhower. It's very interesting uh, how you unravel, uh, uh, told that story. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, yes, I will, Tim. Uh, what, uh, what the question is referring to is that shortly after leaving office, uh, 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 former President Eisenhower made a request of President Kennedy uh, which struck Kennedy as very odd, and this request was described uh, to me by Ted Clifton, who was Kennedy's military aide, uh, who I interviewed at length in Washington, and that was that he wanted to be restored to Army rank, uh, five-star general, uh, and his title thereafter would be General Eisenhower, not, uh, not President Eisenhower. And Kennedy scratches his head uh, when Clifton presents this and says, uh, uh, why would he want to be known as general? Uh, and <clears throat> uh, why would he do this? And um, uh, Clifton said, uh, well, if he's general, then um, uh, he doesn't uh, have to ask you for anything uh, or whatever. And Kennedy says, okay, put the bill in, uh, <clears throat> uh, keep it low. But it puzzled uh, President Kennedy, and it puzzles me slightly. I tell the story uh, through Clifton's eyes. I'm not sure, but in March 1961, shortly after leaving office, uh, former President Eisenhower became General Eisenhower. Uh, today's subject uh, here at Westminster is uh, legacy, and <clears throat> I can't escape the feeling, looking back on that and seeing the five-star flag uh, flapping beneath the American flag <clears throat> on the flagpole uh, just outside our sun porch, that what he was expressing there was the bond that he felt with the soldiers uh, who had uh, fought in World War II and what he was doing, I think, was consecrating the presidency uh, that he had, uh, the two-term presidency in the 1950s, uh, to the cause of World War II and winning the peace, and making it clear uh, that the wellspring of it all uh, were those years uh, abroad uh, in the Great Crusade in Europe. I wonder if there are any veterans in the audience who served uh, under Eisenhower in the war. If you, could you make yourself known by applause or something? Are there people who served with him? I've met several. Yeah, there are. Thank you for your service. Yes. General Eisenhower appreciates that. Uh, there are several questions already coming in, David, about uh, legacy, a legacy you did not refer to. And that has to do with his, uh, your grandfather's warning. Yes at the end of his presidency about the military-industrial complex. You want to come? Tim, thank you. I was going to address that in the speech, except I was a little worried about uh, going over uh, and so on, because that is uh, uh, the farewell address uh, is a speech that presidents, beginning with Harry Truman, uh, customarily give now. And one of the prime characteristics of a farewell address is to impart a legacy and to sum up that legacy in a memorable phrase. There are memorable uh, phrases in the speech that Tim is referring to. This is Dwight Eisenhower's farewell, January 17, 1961, in which he warns the American people against the unwarranted acquisition of influence by a military industrial complex. This is a fascinating speech. It is considered to be, uh, in a poll of rhetoric professors, uh, the greatest speeches of the 20th century. This, is, uh, this ranks among, the, uh, given by an American, this ranks among uh, the top 10 speeches of the 20th century, um, given uh, 72 hours before another one of the top 10 speeches of the 20th century, John Kennedy's inaugural, is also given. There's a story to this speech, which is one reason why I am an historian and, in fact, teach political communications. Uh, I've always been fascinated by this field. 1968, an exposure to speeches uh, did this, but, uh, th but what I encountered at the Eisenhower Library on this speech did it as well. There's a story about this farewell, farewell warning. There are, about, there are numerous drafts of the speech, dividing them up one-third, one-third, one-third. The first third of these drafts uh, and the drafting process was started very early reflects the disappointment that Eisenhower felt about the narrow Republican defeat in 1960. 
Uh, he felt that the Democrats had exaggerated dangers facing the country. He thought uh, missile gaps were, were uh, phony. He thought that we were being pushed in directions that uh, would disturb the stability uh, of the United States, and he was very concerned about it. And so, in effect, for a, a third of these drafts, he warns America against his successor. Somebody gets to the president after the early drafting and says, you can't do that. Uh, <clears throat> Truman gave a farewell. He made your job easier. Your task is to make uh, President Kennedy's uh, task easier. Dwight Eisenhower saw that, uh, understood it, and so the second third, uh, you have the, on the one hand, on the other hand, you have all the qualifiers, and they sort of take everything back, whereupon somebody gets to the president and says, this is wrong, you are looking forward. And in a farewell address, the point is to look backward. It is to uh, meditate uh, and share the lessons of your public career, your time, mid-20th century. That is when that speech becomes one of the greatest speeches ever given, the greatest presidential farewell in history. And it is a meditation on the great riddle of the 20th century, uh, the riddle that Americans faced collectively, which Dwight Eisenhower and other leaders uh, uh, faced and were conscious that they were facing, and that is the coexistence of the greatest material prosperity humankind has ever seen, with the worst war ever fought, uh, with the Great Depression, the tremendous dislocations, uh, the rise of totalitarianism, all raising questions whether democracy was a way of governing uh, that could survive uh, in the 20th century, whether it, it was relevant to 20th century uh, circumstances, whether man's capacity to make moral decisions could keep pace with technology, all of these uh, considerations uh, faced Eisenhower and his generation. That is the topic of the speech. And he submits a timeless remedy uh, or observation. And that is the reason that advanced societies failed in the 20th century is that their population ceased to be citizens. Uh, they would yield decisions that were theirs to make. Uh, they would yield their own opinions uh, to people who would gain temporary ascendancy by dominating the mass media or by being experts and overwhelming people with expert advice. His parting advice to America is never forget we live in a highly technological world. Everything is inter interdependent now. Uh, everybody uh, seeks to become an expert in some field or another, and we are beset by expert advice and so forth. But never forget that if you can't understand it, if this does not serve a purpose, a larger purpose that everybody can recognize and articula articulate, you as a citizen uh, have a right to insist on, uh, on a voice, and democracy depends on you doing it. Uh, this is a warning to uh, American citizens and legislators to stand up for what they believe and not be overwhelmed uh, by the uh, flash uh, and the complexity of modern technology uh, in the decision centers that it spawns. That's exactly what that speech is about. <clears throat> Did, did he expand upon or expound upon that, that uh, warning in, in later years? Uh, I don't think he, uh, actually what we show in Going Home to Glory is that uh, many of his friends uh, questioned him about it. Uh, they, they wanted to know what he meant uh, by it. Uh, a lot of his business friends, uh, uh, Ellis Slater's diary, this is very clear. Uh, and uh, uh, <clears throat> Dwight Eisner made it clear in private that the warning was very heartfelt and it also uh, if you're, in fact, I've been around several Eisenhower uh, era historians uh, here this morning. Uh, if you look at the history of the Eisenhower presidency, you will see that uh, the speech draws attention uh, to something that was actually happening in the Eisenhower years. America, after the Korean War in 53, begins uh, a rather, I would say, steady process of demobilization. Uh, America is mobilized. Uh, as, as far as it can be mobilized in 1945. I think half of all activity in America was government. Uh, we, uh, we had 15 million people in uniform. Uh, that is peak mobilization from the, that 1945 peak with a spike in 1953. Um, what happens throughout the 1950s 
in this uh, effort to restore normalcy, we demobilize. And uh, Eisenhower is drawing attention to that achievement in his farewell address. Uh, and he is uh, uh, reminding Americans that, that this has been underway, and he's warning, I, he's warning them against uh, uh, casually accepting uh, uh, claims and commitments and so forth that would undergo or undermine that process. His idea was uh, America, victorious in war, must now win the peace. Winning the peace means winning the peace at home, uh, having a vital, vibrant democracy, winning the peace overseas, a world safer democracy. Any idea how he would, as a five-star general, the former president, view the U.S. military enterprise today? A very good question. It's, you know, many years uh, since the Eisenhower uh, presidency. Uh, that, that's like uh, uh, somewhat analogous to uh, wondering what Abraham Lincoln uh, would have thought about the First World War. Uh, <clears throat> I think that there is a slight stretch, but I think that uh, Eisenhower's principles are clear enough and that is that when American forces are committed abroad, uh, it is a moral uh, question. Uh, it is morally required that the leadership that commits these soldiers uh, into harm's way be as committed uh, to the achievement of mission and to a victorious outcome as the soldiers are asked to be themselves in the field. Uh, he was, in, during the Vietnam era, he favored strategies to win the war uh, quickly uh, in the early phases uh, and so on, and I think that he would have uh, uh, looked upon the Middle Eastern uh, situations uh, very similarly. What that would have meant uh, tangibly, I don't know, but I will give President uh, Bush and President Obama uh, credit in both cases that I believe that something that you look for in a speech appeals for war. Uh, <clears throat> somebody who's appealing for war uh, always wants to arouse a certain commitment in the office uh, or in the uh, population as a whole because war is going to lay a major claim on everybody's resources. Uh, does the individual uh, advocating it, is he or she similarly committed? And uh, that is uh, uh, what Dwight Eisenhower, uh, that's one of the great morals he took away from World War II. Uh, the leadership, uh, the people in the field, everybody was in it together, everybody had a purpose to serve. Uh, and, and so on. So we don't want to fight wars casually, that's the point. Uh, we don't fight wars as a matter of policy, we fight wars because there's something really uh, significant and vital uh, for America on the line in a war. And a leader has to convey that, uh, the people in the field are going to live that, uh, and we as citizens have to insist on it. In your remarks you referred to regrets that your grandfather had about his presidency. Could you tell us what some of those were? Well, I think he had, uh, uh, certainly his uh, biggest regret is uh, in the presidency is that a successful true-term presidency was not extended uh, into a third or fourth, did not win validation by voters in the 1960 uh, campaign. The fact is, uh, the Eisenhower presidency uh, and the Republican Party in the 1950s uh, uh, was a beginning, uh, and he would live to see a Republican victory in 1968 uh, they would assure him of this. He was not an anomaly. Uh, there was a feeling when Eisenhower leaves office in 61 and 62 that the Republicans had been anomalous, uh, that the Democratic majority was the uh, customary state of affairs. Uh, the Kennedy inauguration has the uh, flavor of a restoration. Uh, that was a Democratic era. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower wondered whether he was an anomaly, and 1960 was a good reason. Uh, to uh, think that, but then he did live to see. One of the very last things he saw in his life uh, was Republicans return to power in 1969, and so I believe that uh, uh, he had uh, at least the satisfaction of uh, believing that he was not an anomaly, but he was the first. He was the first in a line of Republican presidents that would stretch out for a number of decades that his presidency had made a difference. I think he had other uh, specific uh, regrets. You can never uh, thank people enough for supporting you in a campaign uh, and for reposing their, their confidence in you by casting a ballot for you or doing work on your behalf. You can never thank people enough. And um, uh, so I'm sure that there were lots of people that he wanted to bring into government uh, that he couldn't. I think that there, were, there was great misunderstanding be within the Western Alliance. Uh, during the Suez Affair of 1956, and I'm not sure that that was ever quite resolved uh, to his complete satisfaction. One of the closing scenes of Going Home to Glory 
Uh, is Ella Slater presenting Eisenhower with the reviews of the latest book uh, on Suez? And uh, that uh, addressed, uh, I think, a regret uh, that he had uh, as a president. And there were other regrets, but there are great satisfactions uh, as well. And that is that uh, he had a mission as president to restore stability, um, a certain amount of uh, good uh, neighbor feeling in American national politics to provide a setting so that Americans could uh, take on peaceful pursuits. And by the end of the 1950s, I think Americans knew that they had had a great decade uh, and uh, that this period, 1941 to 1960, is a period of extraordinary uh, achievement and progress in American life. He, had, he took great satisfaction from that. A lot has happened since uh, in American politics since 1950s. Uh, the election of 64, uh, you talk about that and, and your grandfather's reaction to what was going on in the Republican Party. Uh, many today view that election as key to what is happening today in the Republican Party. Any comments about that? Well, the conservatives that, that appeared in 1964 did make a huge difference. Uh, and what they did was they uh, they uh, entered politics in 1963 and 64 uh, with a, uh, an, an insight that has really made a difference in 50 years since. And that is political parties uh, have to stand for principles, uh, very clear-cut principles in, in many ways. Uh, you know, we can't hold politicians account uh, for their stewardship in office uh, if they do not commit themselves uh, to certain principles and certain approaches. Uh, what Dwight Eisenhower had in 1964 uh, uh, with Goldwater was a difference over a specific uh, question before the Republican Party in 64, and that was the, uh, uh, the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Uh, the Eisenhower presidency, late Eisenhower presidency, is a period of very rapid uh, progress in civil rights. Eisenhower was not uh, uh, giving uh, memorable speeches on civil rights, but his Justice Department uh, the pace of litigation, school integration, this is, uh, civil rights was uh, moving very, very quickly. And this omnibus civil rights bill uh, before the Congress in 1964 validated it. It was actually a revival of a, a Civil Rights Act of 1866. Uh, we actually had laws on the books that uh, we might have enforced, and I think Goldwater, uh, who was the Republican Party nominee, uh, fastened on that fact. But it would validate uh, this tremendous progress. And it was very important to this country that that validation be bipartisan in Eisenhower's view so that uh, people would come together, the law would be enforced, uh, and uh, uh, we could uh, address uh, wider questions involved, so forth. Goldwater had principled objections to the 64 Civil Rights Act. Principled. Uh, his biographers insist this to a person. If you know things about Goldwater, if you've read his biographies, uh, and so forth, he's a Westerner. He's not somebody that... Uh, uh, really had a racial consciousness at all. He had no, no intention whatsoever of, of uh, being against uh, civil rights uh, uh, in principle, but he did believe on constitutional grounds that he had to oppose the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And I think Eisenhower's view was Barry Goldwater before the 1964 Republican Convention in San Francisco, not for an hour as far as I know, was the choice of rank-and-file Republicans for this nomination. This was an organized conservative movement uh, that's uh, taking this party over and pushing it in a direction on the key issue in 1964 uh, that gave Eisenhower great misgivings. Uh, the good news is that in later years, Barry Goldwater uh, came to regard the Eisenhower years as great years in American history. Uh, as a conservative, what he understood is that Eisenhower had restored stability, that Eisenhower, a conservative man, was uh, uh, was a very great figure uh, in the presidency. And Eisenhower, at the, by the end of his life, uh, I think appreciated uh, Goldwater's uh, character as a Westerner, as a big skies thinker, uh, as an entrepreneur, and as somebody who uh, offered a choice, you know, not an echo in 1964, and politics has sort of uh, fallen in uh, with that sense, and I think there is a reason for it. You refer to your grandfather's uh, principles and, and morals. Uh, can you say, say something about the role of religion in his life and how that might have affected his the way he thought about his presidency or in his uh, post-presidency? Uh, we do know he was a Quaker and became, what did he become again? Uh, well, no, he was a Mennonite. A Mennonite. He, uh, he was a Mennonite and he became a Presbyterian. Here we are in Westminster Presbyterian. <laughs> uh, Mennonite churches were uh, 
uh, pretty confined to certain uh, places. They, they, it's still a very lively uh, faith in Kansas uh, and where I live, uh, or close to where I live, uh, near between Gettysburg and uh, greater Philadelphia uh, and so forth. But uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, you don't, you're, you're not a Mennonite or practicing Mennonite um, or have the opportunity to do that in very many communities in America. Uh, he met and married Mamie Dowd, Geneva Dowd, and she was a devout Presbyterian, and I think her stronger affiliation with the Presbyterian Church uh, drew her husband, Dwight Eisenhower, into becoming uh, not only uh, a attendee uh, at Sunday services, one of the Great memories I have as a boy is every Sunday dressing up in an itchy suit uh, at the White House and going off to the National Presbyterian Church in Washington to hear Dr. Elson. Uh, and he became uh, not only a uh, regular attendee, he became a devout uh, Presbyterian, a contributor uh, to their causes. He dedicated the National Presbyterian Church uh, in Washington and so on. This is all very important. When I talk about character, and I talk about this man, and I ask myself, why was he what he was? Uh, and I see him as a teenager. I think the people that I talked to who reinforced what stood out in my mind as the most important episodes in his life, most importantly, uh, the interviews that I did, were the ministers. Uh, the Reverend Billy Graham, uh, Dr. Elson, uh, who is a, a former pastor at the National Presbyterian Church, Dean Miller, uh, who is head of the Presbyterian Church uh, in Palm Desert, and Robert McCaskill, who headed the Presbyterian Church in Gettysburg. One of the uh, <clears throat> things that uh, Bob McCaskill did for me in Gettysburg is that he ran a tape. It was a little audio cassette. He ran a tape that he had made of Dwight Eisenhower's address to the Carlisle Presbytery in June of 1963 on the importance of the church in the entire orientation of America, the importance of the church in American history, the importance of the church to the concept of democracy and self-rule. And he was taking issue with the uh, Supreme Court decisions that were coming down. It's a fascinating speech. Uh, I sat there and took uh, very careful notes uh, on it, and I reproduce uh, um, most of the text uh, of that speech in Going Home to Glory. And it's a key to him. Uh, that character begins with uh, understanding of uh, uh, the mysteries in life and uh, the requirement uh, of faith uh, as, as part of uh, your ability to live every day, uh, to have the optimism that you need to uh, make decisions uh, and to make a difference. We've talked a lot about your grandfather. Want to say something about your grandmother, Mamie? Well, Mamie is, uh, <laughs> we cover Mamie. Mamie is um, somebody uh, the as told to. Mamie tells many stories uh, in Going Home to Glory. She's uh, one of the best friends, uh, maybe the best friend I've ever had. Uh, she was, uh, the thing about uh, our grandparents were a small family. My mom and dad were in Gettysburg. My three sisters, myself, uh, my grandfather, my grandmother, we were a very tight unit. Uh, I don't think that uh, uh, we were very demonstrative uh, necessarily, uh, and I lay that out. In fact, uh, my grandfather and I are writing letters. I'm at Exeter. He's writing me letters, uh, and I'm writing him letters. Uh, and there's a formality uh, in all of this, but I never doubted growing up, this is something grandparents can really contribute. I never doubted that I had the best friends and I had the best allies of my grandparents that anybody could ever have. And I just never doubted it. And what that means to uh, a young person uh, is something that's become meaningful to us because now we're grandparents. And we have an opportunity to make that kind of difference uh, for our grandchildren, and we mean to. Uh, and uh, Mamie uh, did that for us, and uh, I think I capture her spirit, uh, how much fun she is. Uh, she was a Denver Belle. Uh, she marries this uh, boy from central Kansas. Uh, they have this uh, fabulous life together, which she recalls so memorably in the pages of Going Home to Glory. You referred at the end of your remarks to the living legacy that you bear in your life, and. Your children? Is the Eisenhower legacy continuing on in children? No. And uh, the, the Eisenhower name is still there. We've got uh, our son, Alex, uh, is uh, in fact somebody who assisted us with this book. Uh, he's working with me at the University of Pennsylvania and probably on his way to graduate school. Our daughter, Melanie, works for a, uh, as a child care, or, uh, yeah, child 
life specialist uh, at a hospital in New York, and our daughter Jenny is an equity actress uh, in the greater Philadelphia area. We're very proud of our children, and we have a couple weddings coming up, and uh, we do have a grandchild. Thank you very much, David Eisenhower. Thank you.